Hey YouTube, welcome back to another video. Today is my Pecorni Seminar 2022 in review. I'm going to tell you kind of what happened and also kind of review-ish um, what I think about it. I have a whole big old long thing. And yes, I'm going to talk about the iPad and technology use in probably like the next video. But this is just about the seminar itself. So. A lot of you probably don't know what it is. Uh, what is Picorni Seminar? It's, uh, well, before I even get into that, um, should you go? Probably yes. I'm just going to get the review part out of the way right at the beginning. Assuming you want to play orchestral trombone at kind of like any capacity, I think this would be a big thing to do. So there, there's, a, there's your, your answer that you're waiting for at the end. Um, please watch the rest. Um, I really would like you to watch the rest. Anyway. It's a four-day event held at uh, Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. It used to be in Redlands, California, at Redlands University um, for a long time, and it's moved to Illinois for the last three, four years, something like that. Um, so now it's, now it's in Illinois, which is a bummer, because I could have driven to the one here. Oh, well. Um, of course, it's named after Gene Picorni, the uh, tubist of Chicago Symphony, um, and it is run by Dr. Andrew Glendening, who's always run it um, both at Redlands and now at NIU. Um, so it's for tenor, bass trombones, and tuba, kind of just all the low brass that are in the orchestra, except for you, tenor tubas, get out. So faculty this year, and it changes every year by a little bit, kind of generally the same, but this year's faculty was Tim Higgins, uh, San Francisco principal trombone, of course, Jeremy Wilson, who played second in Vienna Philharmonic and now teaches at Vanderbilt. Um, Randy Haas, who is currently the Cleveland bass trombonist, used to be at Detroit for a long, long time. Um, James Markey, of course, Boston Symphony bass trombonist. Chris Olka, the Cincinnati principal tuba player. Gene McCorney, the Chicago principal tuba player. And uh, there's also Dr. Andrew Glendening, Tim Riordan, um, Re, Riordan, Riordan, I kept saying it kind of weird, something like that, um, and, uh, I think Scott Teggy was also on faculty, um, they're kind of like the, the teacher people, they're also players that are very good, they're just not like the big names you might think of, so a ton of faculty, right, um, a day, each day, you're gonna get up nice and early, especially if you come from the west coast like me, um, and there's an 8 a.m. warm-up, um, that can be done in the group warm-up with everybody, and uh, this year, Dr. Andrew Glendening ran the, the warm-ups. You can do that by yourself, of course, um, and if you're like really serious about wanting to warm-up that day, I guess you can do it by yourself. Um, I like to participate in as much stuff as I can because, honestly, I'm not there to like play my best. I'm there to intake information, and you get information in these group warm-ups. Um, at 8.30, um, the faculty will get together, and they'll play excerpts. This year, they played... Stuff from Siegfried, they played stuff from Alpine Symphony, a couple really cool things. The stuff from Alpine was just mind-blowing with Tim Higgins on principal, um, two tubas, two bass trombones. Man, it was super cool stuff. So you get to just go listen to them literally like 10 feet away, just destroying these um, cool excerpts. At 9 a.m., yes, it's only 9, um, you have a master class for two hours. Um, you have four performers that are in your little group, it's you and three other people, um, and you have a faculty, and so each one of you kind of gets a one a half hour lesson with this faculty while everyone else watches. Um, and it's really cool. Of course, it never quite works out to half an hour each, like the first three people all run over and the last person gets a, sh a shorter time slot. That's just how it goes. Um, very useful stuff. At 11 a.m., so two hours have gone by, um, one of the faculty will give a talk and they'll just present kind of like a little thing on a subject they want for an hour. Um, lots of really cool stuff in these talks. It's, you know, it's not actually playing. You're not hearing them do stuff necessarily, but you get a ton of really cool information out of these. Then you go to lunch, and trust me, you need it at this point. <laughs> You're so tired. Um, you get an hour and a half. When you come back, um, another talk by another faculty. So there's two of these a day, um, and it happens for an hour. 
At 2.30, there's another two-hour master class. Typically, um, you're only in one of these master classes a day. So maybe you rest in the morning and you can just go and watch master classes or you rest in the evening and you can just go watch master classes. Um, one of the days, you have to do two of them. Um, at 4.30, the sections get together. You're in a section with three other people. Um, the master class is with three or four of the same instrument. The sections, of course, are two tenor trombones, bass trombone, and tuba. Um, you get together, you get in a big square, at least you did this year, and you just play excerpts at a faculty. Um, this is really cool because you get to play some of the cool reps, some of the rep that you don't play very often. Um, uh, and you get comments, you get things to fix, you get to hear other uh, sections do it first, maybe. You get to go, oh, we should we should play these shorter and we should, uh, you know, not breathe in this spot, etc. It's really fun stuff. The problem is it's only an hour. So at most, your section gets 15 minutes of kind of like playing and comments. It'd be really cool if this could be longer. But I don't know where you would fit it in in this calendar. It's a very busy calendar. So that for an hour at 5.30, um, two of the faculty will give a recital. Um, usually about an hour. It could be like a little bit longer. Um, and it's just... So cool, and the NIU uh, recital hall is a great little space, especially for low brass, actually. And you just get to get everything out of these players from a really close distance. And they play really cool rep, and they just play their butts off. Really cool stuff. And then after that, you go get dinner, and you hang with everybody else. And that's a whole day. It is a very long day. Um, for me, getting up at 7 a.m., that's 5 a.m. West Coast time, um, and going until midnight that time so it's a very long day you get like maybe six hours of sleep and you just do it all again um totally worth it at the last day you skip a couple of the last classes in the day and instead there's a mock audition where at least this year um they'll run it just like a real audition and what they did is they said uh this person and this person and this person would advance to the next round and they just leave it there um, and then we have like a final get together thing where we talk around and then a lot of people leave, some people hang, etc. So, uh, it's pretty fun. Let's go over the fact that there's very little free time. Um, like I said, you're only in one master class a day typically, so you kind of have those two hours free, but I wouldn't count it as free time because you want to go watch these master classes. You do not want to miss the information that is being presented. The whole point of being there is to just drink through a fire hose all this information, record things, write things down, get this information in your brain. Um, so really, there's like no free time. You get to go to dinner, hang out with people, and that's about it. And maybe like while you're in the shower, you're like, oh man, that's what happened today, and then you pass out. Um, yeah, you actually don't play very much at this. At least I didn't. Um, like the first day, I like barely even warmed up because instead of the group warm up, we had to sign in and then we went straight to master class. So if you're thinking about going and just like playing like eight hours a day, that's for me, that's not what happened. I had to play in master classes, basically cold every time. There's basically no warm up, and then have to play in the section thing, basically cold every time. Um, I don't think this is a huge issue. Like I said, the point of this is not to go and like play your best and impress everybody but rather to get information so later you can play them. Um, and yes, that's uh, that's everything about that. So my thoughts about this year, kind of my review of the Picorni Seminars. This is the first time I've gone. Um, it's happened for at least 10, 12 years, something like that. So the location, it's fine. You know, it's all right. Uh, NIU has got a nice, nice-ish campus. It's not bad at all. You stay in a hotel, you can on campus and it's a pretty easy walk to music building um it's kind of hard to get to because it's like an hour plus outside chicago um from o'hare to niu so if you don't have somebody to drive you you got to get like a really expensive uber you got to get like a limo or something and it just it tallies up to a lot of money um, unless you find someone to drive you and that's just kind of a bummer to have to fly somewhere and then do a bunch of travel on the other end of that um, it would be nice to have it closer to a location. Redlands is kind of the same way. I'm not even sure how people flew into that, honestly. Um, I would drive there, but obviously that's that's my choice. Um, I got really lucky, and someone gave me a ride. Thank you, um, person that gave me a ride. I will not name you, just in case. 
Um, of course, you're in Illinois, so it's kind of humid. It's kind of hot. Honestly, it wasn't that bad there. Uh, but if you don't like that stuff, then uh, don't go to Illinois in the summer, I guess. Um, the biggest bummer, I think, was the long distance to get to food and to get to, like, the hangs and stuff after the day was over. Because you had to get food, you had to get lunch, and you had to drive at least, like, five minutes to get to anything. There's basically nothing on campus. So that is a bummer. It's nice to just, like walk to a building on campus, you know, get subway or something really awful, and then just walk back. But you can't really do that in uh, NIU. You have to really have somebody who has a car that you just glom onto and you drive with them everywhere. Um, the facilities actually in the music building are actually pretty nice. It's not like brand new or anything, but there's lots of spaces. The spaces sound pretty good. Um, it's not like hot inside. Sometimes they get a little bit cold, like too much AC. Um, the recital hall is very good. The concert hall is also really good. Um, the on-campus hotel where I stayed and most of the other people stayed, eh, it was fine. Um, it got the job done. And the distances on the campus are not too far. Some of you have probably been on giant college campuses where like, all right, well, it's on the same campus, and it turns out to be like two miles. Um, those distances aren't too bad. But again, you have to drive to get food. Um, so apart from the physical realities, the faculty were all amazing. Every single one of them, including those kind of smaller names as you might put them. Um, everybody had such amazing sounds and thoughts, recitals, master classes. Everybody in that entire list. I personally did master classes with Randy Haas, Jim Markey, Tim Riordan, Dr. Glenn Denning, and Chris Olka. And I watched a couple other master classes when I had the time. And I did excerpt master classes, so in the section, with Jim Markey, Gene McCorney, and Chris Olka. So I got some, like, serious players. Since you're doing so many things every day, you get to hear from so many different amazing players every day. I, I just can't, like, put into words how good these master classes were. Some of the best information I got were from watching other people play for Jim Markey. And I'm just going, oh, my God, all this information is gold! Um, and I wrote a bunch of it down, of course. Um, so outside the mass classes, which were maybe the best part, um, the recitals were amazing. So first night, Gene Picorni and Tim Higgins. Um, Gene has been a tubist of Chicago Symphony forever, very long time, and he just had an intensely musical performance all on his big C tuba. He did not bring an F tuba and play normal tuba solo rep. He played on the big horn, and it just didn't matter. It sounded so good. He was so musical. He overdoes everything just the right amount, so it just comes across as being super intentional. I, I can't say enough good things about this recital, and I cried in it at least, I'm going to say twice. Um, Tim Higgins was super cool. He played the second half, and he opened up the stage. He was like, hey, I'm going to play these pieces. If you want to set up a chair and sit, right next to me, right behind me on the stage, go ahead. And so I pulled up a chair and sat directly to his back left and watched him play his first uh, piece, several movements long. It was like 20 minutes. Super cool to see him up close and see how relaxed he was, how he approached things. You can see the music going by and he's just like, woo, woo, woo. so cool to be on stage. Like that just never happens. You don't get to like be in a recital of someone performing at such a high level. That was very cool. I did not do it for the second piece he played too. I went back to the audience just so I could like stretch out and stuff. We'll talk about sitting in a moment. And he did play his uh, his trombone concerto, which was very cool. Second night, Randy Haas, Jim Markey, um, they alternated pieces, so it wasn't like first half, second half. They just uh, went on and off. Um, they both played to their strengths, I would say. I mean, they're both very amazing musicians and players, but they they have their strengths, right? Um, Haas kind of played more lyrical stuff, Marky with a little more angular, a little more loud kind of things. Um, Randy Haas played a Schumann fantasy that was, I mean, just magical. It was, I mean, exactly what the kind of thing that he would want to play, and you could tell. He just poured himself into it. Um, again, I think I cried during that one. Um, amazing recital as well. The last night of recitals was Jeremy Williams and Chris Olka. Um, Jeremy went first and just destroyed this recital. Played for like 40 minutes straight. Didn't even leave the stage. Um, just 
insane musicality, just so many insane like dynamic highs and lows. The I just I like can't even put into words how quiet he played. Um, he just kept like dropping the, the dynamic level, and you're just like as a trombonist, you're kind of going, "No, you're gonna lose this note. It's not worth it." Uh, you know, play that a little bit, a little bit louder, and you would just keep dropping it. And you're like, "No, no, no, no! You can't, you can't do that. Stop it!" Um, and again, he made me cry. Um, and Chris Olka played great too. All, again, all in a giant C tuba. <laughs> These guys are masochists. I don't know why they're playing on the big horns, but they can make it work. Um, like I said, the master classes were invaluable. Every single one of them, including the non-big name teachers. I got amazing stuff out of my master class with Dr. Glenn Denning and the uh, master class we had with Tim Riordan, who's a trombone teacher in the Chicago area. Um, and like I said, the ones that I got to uh, just observe gave me some of the best information. And just being up close to the sounds they make and watching them do it is priceless. You don't get that anywhere else except for like individual lessons that you have to pay a bunch of money for and you have to be in the same area, all that kind of stuff. But just being up close, um, Jim Markey, I have a recording of this, um, was working with somebody else and he was like, all right, so here's how you need to play high. You need to be, you need to have like this fast air and it comes from down here. And he played the loudest high E flats, like E flats above high B flat. On bass trombone, I've I think that are possible, that have probably ever happened. And he was like, oh, wow, that was pretty good, huh? And we're all like, oh, my God, dude, that was like 200 decibels and sounded amazing. And he played like six of them. I mean, <laughs> just insane to see this happen. And you go, oh, I actually kind of understand, like, I can't do it myself, but I understand how there's a pathway to that point. That was really cool. Um, the talks. Um, hour-long presentations with masters of the craft, right? Um, some, to me, are more relevant than others. Of course, I'm not the kind of like person that goes to these things that it's really kind of aimed at. It's aimed more at college undergrads, college master students who are trying to be professional uh, orchestral players. I am way past that, five years out of my master's. Um, and I play in orchestras, but I do a lot of other stuff. I have, like, a much more varied palette than a lot of these players and teachers kind of, like, understand. And so some of the master classes kind of went, or not the master classes, but the talks went, kind of went past me. And they really landed with a lot of, the, like, the younger people, the people in college, people really on that orchestral track. Um, I wouldn't mind winning an audition, and if they come up in my area, I'll definitely take them. But that's not the only thing that I do. So... Depending on who you are, these talks will be more useful um, or less. And then, um, like Randy Haas gave a talk that was all about these like really specific details about playing in an orchestra that I think not very many people in the uh, audience would really understand. Like I've sat with very good orchestras, and I kind of understand like he's talking about these little intricate details about just like making sure you're all aiming the same direction and moving with the principal trombone, like all these little things where it's like wow, okay, I understand, and this is very useful information, but for someone who's like a sophomore in college, they're going to forget all of this before they get to that point. So kind of both ends of the spectrum in, uh, in uh, usefulness. But there's always useful information in these talks, assuming you can stay awake because, boy, howdy, are you tired uh, basically the whole time. So there are some downsides. Um, I'll give those real quick. There's very little playing time. I mean, maybe total I played like three hours over the course of the whole thing, unless you skip the master classes and the talks, which you shouldn't do because that's not the point of the whole seminar. You need to get the information, not go practice your scales. Like, that's that's cool. Do that after the seminar. Go home and do that. Don't do it at the seminar because that's not the point of the whole thing. They're really long, hard days with basically no downtime to rest, or process anything. Um, honestly, the worst part for me is be so much sitting. You have to sit in all these master classes. You sit in the talks. Um, you sit during the recitals. My back was just destroyed, and it's still still a little messed up now just from sitting so much. Kind of a weird thing to complain about, but I don't like to sit that much. It's actually harder on me than doing days at Disney, where I sit and then basically work out and run around and play really hard and then sit. That's easier than going to 
Pecorin. And if you're like me, you have to take time off of work. I definitely lost out on some stuff I could have done last week to do this. Um, if you're not in school, uh, go do this because you don't have to take time off. Um, the upsides, though. I've talked about some already. Inspiration just like is like pouring out of my eyes and my ears. I just, I hear these people, I hear them play, I hear them talk, and I'm just like, I want to practice so badly. I just finished playing um, large tenor for like two and a half hours straight because I'm just like, I want, I need to put that time in. I have so many things I want to work on. Um, so many reminders as to why I play. Sometimes in the grind, in the daily grind, I'm like, why do I do this again? Like this, it's kind of hard. I'm just kind of tired and like, I don't know if I like this. Uh, I got a lot of that reason from this um, seminar. Um, you get to hear some of the best sounds in the business every day for hours. Um, you really you don't get that anywhere else unless you're like in that setting and you get to play with these people every day. Even if you're getting lessons and you get to play next to an amazing teacher, you only get that for an hour. Um, maybe you do some kind of studio class and they play in that. You don't get nearly as much as this. So that was really cool. Even at something like ITF where you're going to recitals and stuff, you're not getting it this consistently for days at a time. Um, and then more important, um, more important than almost anything, is that you get to form relationships with your fellow uh, performers, students and stuff at the conference. That's a huge part of these things that I don't think you can overstate. I still have like lifelong friends from going to Dutch Bass Trombone Open, the Lace Trombone Festival, I mean, even ITF a few years ago, um, IWBC. I think that's one of the best parts about this is just expanding your network and just making friends with people that don't live where you live. Um, the hangs after the day, going out, getting food, drinking some beer if you're of age, of course, um, and getting to talk with the faculty one-on-one, -on -one, especially the hangs, you don't get to do that anywhere. Um, in real life, they're probably not going to hang out with you. But these things, it's kind of, you know, it's part of the thing for them to talk to you and you get to pull information out of them that otherwise you're just not going to get. I heard a lot of really cool stuff about Jeremy Wilson's time in Vienna and like little funny anecdotes and stories that unless we were just like friends, he's probably not going to bring up at any point. I'm not going to feel like I want to ask if I'm just like a student or something. Huge advantage of just hanging out with these people. So my experience, I had a ton of fun. Um, it was really hard on my body, especially. It was pretty hard on my mind as well. I was so tired having to intake all this information. Still worth it. Um, and actually much more useful for me now than it would have been three, four years ago even, just because I'm such a better student than I used to be. I actually write notes and record things and like prepare things a little more. Um, I recorded every master class, most of the talks, not for distribution. I'm not going to be putting them up on the internet, but just for my ears. Um, I took a bunch of notes. I have some like really gold things. I would think I would just be sitting there um, like in a master class and I'd be like, oh, somebody said something yesterday and I would write that down. And that's some of the best information that I have. It's just stuff that I went, oh my God, I should have written this down. And I, I did it <laughs> like a day late or two days late. I wish I could have gone in the past, especially when I was here in Redlands, but I don't think I would have been as prepared. I'm age-wise pretty behind the curve compared to a lot of people, so I don't think it would have been the best idea. Who knows? Maybe I would have gotten a lot better sooner. Um, I was still not prepared enough for this. Um, the, there's the uh, mock audition at the end, and I just really didn't prepare this stuff as much as I should have to just present myself well. I just kind of like uh, cold turkeyed it, as you would say. And that's just not the right move. I really should have put my time in, had a better understanding. I did prepare these section excerpts because they gave us some rep I'd never played. So I listened and played along to like most of those pieces. And I'm really glad I did that because there's some stuff that tripped other people up. Um, but still some stuff I could have prepared better, including the stuff that I played in master classes. Um, made some great friends. Howdy, uh, friends. Hopefully you're not watching this video because you already went to the seminar and I don't need you to watch this. Um, and I talked to the faculty as much as I could, which was not very much. There's just no time to talk to them. They're very busy. You're very busy. Um, but I did. I did get some little uh, little one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and there's some really good hangs um, at Fatty's, which is a pretty good little bar with some 
food. I'm not going to call it good food, but it certainly has food. Um, and last of all, I highly recommend that you go, if you're a performance major in college or a young professional, there are several of us that were not in school, and I think we all had a pretty good time. Um, and it's definitely worth the time and the money for the information that you get. And honestly, it doesn't cost that much. Maybe I was like $1,200 all in, something like that. I couldn't tell you. I haven't tallied it all up. Anyway, that's it, Corny 2022. Next video, I'm gonna talk about the technology that I used at the festival um, and how useful it was. Bye-bye.